Hello, and thank you for joining and welcome to the program, Achieving EHS Excellence, Parsons Corporation, the 2019 Campbell Award winner. For this webinar, attendees will be in a listen-only mode. If you need technical assistance, please submit your question under the support tab located on the right-hand side of your screen. If you wish to submit a question during the presentation, please use the Q&A tab also located on the right-hand side of your screen next to the technical support tab. Presenters will do their best to answer your questions. However, due to time constraints, not all questions may be addressed during this webinar. Now, I'd like to turn this presentation over to Catherine Mendoza. Thank you and welcome everybody to the Campbell Institute webinar. Um, first, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Catherine Mendoza. I'm the Senior Program Manager for the Campbell Institute and as, as well as the EHS Director for the National Safety Council. Uh, part of my responsibility is, is to manage the Campbell Award, and so I'm very honored to be um, joined with Jason Pounsel, by Jason Pounsel from Parsons Corporation um, for this webinar, uh, Achieving EHS Excellence. Um, before I hand it over to Jason, I just wanted to spend just a moment talking about what the Campbell Award is to give you guys a little bit of context. The Campbell Award uh, is given by the National Safety Council and recognizes excellence in environment, health, and safety. Um, so we um, organizations apply for this award. We go through a very rigorous uh, review process um, where we look at their EHS management systems. Um, we understand how it works within their organization and also, of course, the culture within their organization. Uh, we then select the winning uh, company and spend uh, the rest of the year um, making sure to share their best practices with other organizations, hopefully helping them uh, to, to achieve excellence themselves. Um, Parsons Corporation was the uh, Campbell Award, Award winner in 2019, and so I, uh, with that, um, I will turn it over to Jason to share some of uh, his expertise. Hello. Hello. Good morning, everyone, or uh, good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Um, so for the next hour or so, I figured I'd just spend some time with you and discuss uh, a little bit about our journey, what uh, what we have done in Parsons to uh, get to where we're at now, and uh, by no means do we believe we are uh, done with our journey. In fact, um, we really believe we're just beginning, and, that, and that's part of the process is to continuously improve upon, um, you know, what's been accomplished. It was a big accomplishment for us to um, win the Campbell Award in 2019. Uh, you could say it was a bit of a long road for us. Uh, I, I would say it was a good learning road um, just to kind of go through the process, be around the Campbell Institute, understand uh, what EHS excellence really is, and uh, to, to uh, achieve some of the things that we've been striving towards. But like anything else in life, you know, once you get to a certain level, you realize there's uh, more to go. So uh, just look, looking at our agenda, uh, what I want to cover first off is what we do uh, as an organization. Uh, you know, why, why do we exist? What services do we provide? Uh, to the public, but then I'll get into some of the uh, specific uh, elements, philosophical elements. Uh, going to purposefully, uh, purposefully be a little bit high level here. I'm not going to get into too many tactics because I believe there's some important uh, philosophical foundations that need to be in place uh, in order to uh, even strive to uh, start to achieve some of the tactics that will get into place. That said, um, as we go forward, if you do have some questions specific to, tac uh, to the tactics of, you know, what we do, how we do it, feel free to, to ask those and, you know, we'll address them as we go. I'm going to spend or leave some time at the end to um, address uh, questions. That said, if you've got questions along the way, feel free to share them and uh, uh, we'll address them uh, as we go through. Um, like I said, I'll cover some elements. The list is not exhaustive it's not all inclusive um, it, it's really important to understand that um, different organizations have different climates and therefore uh, the things that take place to achieve success in those organizations will differ the key is to um, you know maintain uh, something to strive towards you know the whole time and so we'll, we'll get into that so let me talk a little bit about what we do so Parsons is 76 years old. We went public in May of 2019, so 
we've been publicly traded for the last year. Uh, prior to that, we were private or, well, we're still employee-owned, um, mostly employee-owned. Prior to that, we were 100% employee-owned. Um, and so our history, our legacy is, is a uh, engineering firm, uh, PMCM work, construction, um, engineering, environmental engineering. Um, we have pivoted towards technology. We're heavily involved in things like smart cities, intelligent transportation, and we've got an entire um, defense market. So we're involved in intelligence, um, security, both physical and cyber, uh, surveillance, getting involved in space operations. Uh, so we've really started to uh, change with the times as the need to um, better the world, which is part of what we aspire to do every day. Uh, as the needs that are required to do that have changed, we, you know, we've changed with them. Uh, that said, we uh, have um, held true to uh, some core things that, um, that we believe is what it takes to, to drive forward. So one of those core things, that drives us is our commitment to cor corporate social responsibility. So um, I would say if you are um, putting things down that are critical, that are uh, foundational, uh, it's a commitment to corporate social responsibility. So for us, that there's three legs to that. Governance. So our leadership, policies, procedures that gu guide our quest for delivering a better world. In other words, these are the things that um, govern uh, the way that we do the things that we do. Environment, how we affect the environment, uh, both in what we do, how we do it, um, how sustainable the things that we do are, the projects that we deliver, um, and the culture that we carry, carry out, how we go about getting things done. Society, how we provide a healthy, safe, and inclusive work environment. So these include things like inclusion and diversity, uh, things like ethics, uh, where 11 years straight have been uh, uh, selected as one of the world's most ethical companies. We've got a very large uh, Parsons give, Gives Back programs. Uh, so, so for me personally, that's a big driver, uh, is giving back, being part of something bigger than just the services we provide, just the operations, just the business ethics. So why that's important is if you are going to achieve EHS excellence, uh, you've got to have a set of shared beliefs. You've got to have a climate that's conducive to that a climate that's conducive to, um, you know, going forward and striving towards things. Well, in order to do that, you've got, uh, what, basically what defines a climate is shared beliefs, shared perceptions within an organization. So if it's not philanthropic, you know, uh, opportunities, it's gotta be something. So for us, it's philanthropic uh, um, endeavors. For us, it's uh, environment. For us, it's government. Uh, the key is it's, it's gotta be something. There's gotta be a, a focus, a drive, um, and a, it's a, a uniformity in that. If there's not a common goal that you're driving towards, it's going to be um, very difficult, if not impossible, to achieve EHS, uh, EHS excellence. One of the things that you um, may have seen throughout your career, maybe you see it currently in your organization, is a lot of siloing of different things. You've got your environmental group that functions in one silo, your EHS group of functions or your safety group separate from your environmental group. Then you've got an operations group. Um, when these um, organizations separate uh, function as separate or separate divisions, separate departments, whatever uh, the verbiage is, uh, the key is when you're separate, it's pretty much impossible to drive towards excellence in EHS. EHS has got to be integrated into everything. Well, you can't be in, you can't integrate it if there's not a shared um, target or some shared goals to, you know, accomplish um, along the way with that. So we're a values-driven organization, first and foremost. Uh, one of the things that if, if uh, you're taking notes, I'd, I'd encourage you to pay special attention to this slide and ask yourself a question. Um, or ask yourself the question on this slide, where would you place your organization on a continuum below? So let me kind of just go through the three types of organizations that um, you know I've I've laid out here. Now, obviously, there's you could pick this apart. You could add to it. You could take away for, uh, from it. But from a broad point of view, there's three types of drives when it comes to EHS. An avoidance-driven organization. EHS management and philosophy is based upon injury and illness, an incident avoidance. 
EHS programs that are voyage driven typically lack a systematic operationally integrated approach. So it's basically we want to avoid things happening. Beyond that, we just want to drive on and get things done. Second level, the next level, what I would say the next level of, of, of EHS sophistication would be a compliance driven program. EHS management system, excuse me, EHS management system and philosophy is based upon complying with standards and regulations, typically designed to meet legal and specification minimums. Um, you've all probably said at one time or another in your career, um, you know, we, uh, meeting OSHA is the bare minimum, um, which is a true statement. These are things you have to do legally, right? But there's more, there's more to OSHA. There's local regulations. There's, um, uh, it may be state regulations. There are 28 states within the U.S. that have state regs. Um, what we do as part of, a, a, again, getting into a tactic, we require for every project we have, every facility, to have a legal compliance register at, the, at startup where you've got to register all of the different rules and regulations, be it um, environmental, um, sustainability related, um, safety related, whatever. Just so there's an understanding, what must we comply with? Now that doesn't mean that's all we do. That's just so that there's a clear understanding of all of the um, rules and regs that we, we've got to follow. And then the third on that continuum is a values-driven organization. People first emphasis, Focus on EHS stewardship and exposure control at all levels. Management systems are fully integrated into and aligned with business and operational imperatives. Now, this is, this is kind of like when you get to where you want to go, everybody is playing from the same sheet of music. We're all, um, you know, speaking the same language as far as what the expectation is, how EHS is integrated into everything we do. Uh, it would be disingenuous to say that we function at a five on a, when I say we, I'm referring to Parsons, at a five at all times. Uh, I, I believe there's always room for improvement. Uh, an organization can always improve. In fact, I would say for me, a turning point and really um, hoping and, and finding some real genuine hope in where we we're going as an organization was a few years back. I was in a meeting with our executive leadership team and we were discussing this very continuum and where some of our leaders felt we were on the journey. And um, there was some really honest conversation on where we were and where we needed to go. Which, uh, w with us, which is the case with many organizations, um, it took some things to happen to get us to really drive towards being a values-driven organization. And when we had that conversation, um, the, the opinion of most folks was we were somewhere between a three and a four, but needed to get to between a four and a five. Now, we're a pretty large organization. We've got operations throughout um, North America, um, Middle East, Africa, parts of Asia, and Europe. So when, when that's the case, you're always going to have pockets of excellence, and then you're going to have pockets of areas that really need to improve. Uh, you know, one of the things that we as an organization got to go through was um, some on-site visits with the uh, Campbell Institute assessment team going to different projects and being able to, um, you know, have the, the, out, the outsider's view of, of what we're doing and to be able to see that we've got these pockets of where things are just done and they're dialed in. And we've got some other pockets where we can get better. And what we were able to notice that is, when you've got a larger, you know, what, what you could call corporate climate of, hey, this is how we do things, um, that works. But you also need to have that locally and regionally and continue to drive it and continue to, to go forward there. So, again, if you're um, asking yourself questions or if you are looking to get better, ask yourself this question. Where would you rate your organization on this continuum? And even more importantly, not just where would you rate it, where would your leaders rate it? Your operational leaders is, is what I'm referring to. I'm not talking about your um, EHS management or your senior EHS management. Really, let's talk about your um, business development folks, your operations folks. Um, would they even care to address a question like this? Uh, if, if the answer to that is no, then um, there's a lot of work that to be done uh, in, in the area of um, raising the value. Uh, values are, are critical, you know, um, 
moving on to talk about that, core, uh, our six core values are integrated into everything we do. And I, I'm not, that's not something that, you know, we just say. I, you, you hear it in meetings. Um, you see it in proposals. Um, you, you see it in uh, behaviors, which, which, is, which is most critical. If you really want to, and, and you've, you've heard it said before, um, you know, don't tell me, show me. Show me what you, you really are. Show me what you believe. It, it's easy to say something, but show it every day. Um, you know, I call it walk the talk. Uh, so these six core values are things that we say are non-negotiables. These are things, and, and so um, I, I like to draw a line whenever I'm talking to folks about um, safety value. You know, some folks say safety is a priority, safety is a value. The way I differentiate it, and um, you know, you could call it semantics, but the way I differentiate it is priorities may change based upon the situation. Values don't. Values are non-negotiables. These are things that are going to be the way they are all the time because that's just the way they are. So when it comes to us, safety, quality, integrity, diversity, innovation, and sustainability are things that are going to be integrated into everything that we do all the time, regardless of the situation. If a project that we're pursuing or a client that we're pursuing um, or some type of endeavor or innovation that we're pursuing, does not lend itself to integrating one of these values, it's something that we just don't do. Uh, again, if you are going to uh, have a program, a EHS management system that you aspire to uh, be excellent in, you've got to have some principles that you just won't change. And so these are ours. These don't have to be yours, uh, but these are commitments that we make every day. Um, in everything that we do. So let's talk a little bit about shared goals. I talked about uh, a cli climate being defined as shared perceptions, uh, shared beliefs. So um, one of uh, our primary goals, if you were to ask us, what if Parsons Corporation, in a sentence, tell me what you want to do. We want to deliver a better world by making the world safer and more interconnected. Now, there's a lot that goes into that. Obviously, that, that that's a large statement. Uh, but how we do that is having cultural tenets. So again, looking at climate as shared beliefs or perceptions, culture would be uh, how you uh, move forward in those beliefs, how people feel, identify with, and do things to adhere to those beliefs. So, so some of the uh, things that we continuously do, empowering teams, uh, respecting innovation, valuing innovation, uh, in especially right now, and we are seeing the world uh, need to pivot and become adaptable in a way that the world's never been required to do that. If you don't value innovation, if you don't value change, if you don't value adaptability, if you don't value failure at times, uh, because realize when you choose to innovate, when you choose to be agile, when you choose to uh, adapt to situations, there's going to be times where you fall short. Uh, but if you don't value those things in the organization, uh, then you're, you're never going to reach those higher levels. Uh, remember this, little, uh, small risk, small reward. Uh, there are, you, you've got to be willing to innovate, respect innovation, value innovation to grow. Give folks room to be empowered. You know, I, I would say one of the critical changes that we made in the last few years uh, was really putting an emphasis on more empowerment of every individual. When you empower folks in an organization, some really cool things begin to happen. Some really uh, innovative and exciting things uh, begin to happen. So these are uh, ethos uh, uh, that we focus on all the time. These are ethics, again, that are tied to our, our, our core values. There's times where um, our customers, our subcontractors, other stakeholders uh, have a hard time really understanding, getting with uh, the, that value-driven approach that we take to everything. And, and the, the reason being is not every organization functions that way. So the, the uh, question sometimes becomes, well, why are we doing things this way? Why is there such a focus on quality? Why is there such a focus on safety all the time? Why is there such a focus on integrity? Because if we don't do those things, then we aren't who we are. 
And if we aren't who we are, we can't claim things that we claim, you know. So um, as Campbell Institute or Campbell Award winners, uh, there's a banner that we are expected to carry, but it goes beyond that. Uh, because if you aren't who, um, you know, the, the award, the award's an, a one-time award that acknowledges uh, what, what's been done. But uh, if, if you don't maintain that, uh, it, it kind of goes beyond not honoring the, the award. It, it goes into not being what, you know, we're meant to be. And other things I, I ask my people all the time, so when I, the, the people who work within uh, the uh, SHE organization, but even beyond that, our operational leaders is, you know, why do we do what we do? If we're truly focused on delivering a better world, um, then there's artifacts, there's cultural uh, activities that are going to come, you know, come through that. So let me take you through these five guiding principles. I talked before about being in the, uh, so this was a few years ago. I was in an executive committee meeting and we were discussing um, where our EHS program was. And in Parsons, we call it SHE, Safety, Health, and Environment. There's different organizations call it different things. Uh, but we were discussing where we were at. So one of the, uh, uh, and within that, we, we discussed the continuum that, um, you know, where, where we thought we were on that continuum, you know, how we could get better. Out of that meeting, we uh, these five guiding principles came out. So specific to our safety program, number one, anyone can provide effective safety feedback to others regardless of position or title. Now, many organizations uh, make statements like this. We've said stuff like this for years. What came out of this meeting, though, is these five guiding principles um, were memorialized, and they were shared throughout the entire organization. So then it became okay. It became acceptable when a senior leader who may be at a work site um, and may not be complying with something, may not be doing something, maybe they didn't know they were supposed to do it, um, you know, didn't participate in the, uh, the take five pre-task meeting, did not review the AHA, maybe is not wearing uh, the appropriate personal protective equipment, what, whatever the case may be, uh, the, the opportunity or the feeling of empowerment of any individual to provide feedback was now okay. It was okay because it became something that was our ethos. It was one of our guiding principles. It's something we all took pride in. Uh, and there was some training that went into that. We had to train our senior folks to be approachable, uh, train them to accept feedback. It's, you know, it's okay to, uh, you know, not always be right. It's okay to uh, learn from everyone around you. I, I would say personally in my career, one of the most important things that happened to me some years ago, you know, when, when I was younger in my career, I wanted to be that person that knew everything and had it all figured out. Uh, I, I didn't, I, I knew all the rules. I read all the books. I had all the education that I thought I needed. Well, something happened to me along the way where someone who was not a safety professional uh, was actually a senior operations uh, person within uh, an organization I was working for, uh, really began to school me. And, and I don't mean that negatively at all. Just really began to mentor me on how to um, treat people, how to uh, behave in an organization, how to get things done. Uh, the, when I became teachable, uh, things started to change in my career. And since then, to this point, to this day, I make it a point to try and learn something from every person I come in contact with. Um, I just feel like it makes me a better person. It makes me a better professional. Uh, it makes our organization better. And that all begins with number one, anyone can provide, provide feedback. If you're not willing to provide it or accept it, um, it's going to be tough. Number two, all stakeholders feel enabled to stop work when conditions warrant. So that's somewhat of a continuation of number one. Anyone can provide feedback, but also anyone can stop work. Um, and as um, many, many of you know, that's easier said than done. You know, you know we could say that anyone can stop work, but when you go out and stop a construction project um, and they, uh, the, you're going to have to answer for, the, for that. A lot of folks are going to have questions. Well, we needed to make that okay with any organization. We need to make sure that everyone in the organization knew this is acceptable. Now, there's a difference between act, uh, you know, perceived risk an actual risk. We all know that. But the, 
we also have to remember perception is reality. So if someone perceives that there's a risk and perceives that there's something that is um, dangerous to themselves or to a coworker or to a member of the public or another stakeholder, we've got to respect that as an organization. Stop and work, we, I, I, I prefer to say pause work. Uh, if you say stop work, sometimes you will lose your audience. If you're talking to a operational leader, if you're talking to a production person and you say stop work, if you're talking to a scheduler, um, that makes them a little nervous because there's a lot of things that, uh, that drive what they're doing that related to getting the work done. Uh, pausing work and explaining to them the importance and the value of why we're doing this and why overall, this is going to make us a better organization. This is going to deliver a better, higher quality product. It's going to improve on morale. Um, really goes a long way in, in, in um, you know, getting folks on board with that. Number three, everyone is engaged in the safety process, and they take those practices home to their families. So for a lot of years, um, safety uh, was a very big deal for us in the organization. And I, and I, don't, I, I wouldn't say that we... Um, didn't care about what folks did after work. It just was, you know, the things that affected us, our EMRs and, you know, your, your, your uh, workers' comp premiums and all of the, you know, recordable rates and, and all the incident rates and such, these affect uh, work-related risk, work-related incidents and such. Uh, we had to pivot and realize that this, we aren't dealing with people who, uh, you know, people aren't 40-hour-a-week people. They are 24-7, 365 day people. And if safety is truly who we are, we've got to integrate it into everything we do. That means teaching folks to take it home, teaching them to value their health, teaching them to value, um, you know, the, the, the things that they do at home on the weekend. If it's yard work, if it's eating habits, if it's sleeping habits, if it's time with their kids, if it's time on the road, if it's 4th of July, I mean, there is nothing that, we don't encourage our folks to be cognizant of when it comes to taking safety home. It's got to be critical. And, uh, you, and you can't engage folks if you don't truly value who they are, value where they're at, and value everything about them. So that became a big part of our guiding principles. Number four, safety is included in all planning process, uh, phases of project execution. So for us, we've broken that, the, the phases of project, uh, excuse me, project execution into five phases. Beginning with business development, going into startup. So business development can be developing uh, a, a client relationship, developing um, uh, a, a project, an RFP, a proposal, whatever, whatever that looks like, moving into a new facility, um, you know, moving into a new uh, market, uh, merging or acquiring another organization, whatever it is, developing that process, we've integrated SHE practices into that moving and then you move into startup then you move into your operations phase and that typically is where the activity is activity is that's where the meat is that's where stuff begins to happen that's when you're doing what you came here to do right um you know i i tell folks all the time you know what you, you hear say well we're 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 here to be safe well the reality is is you're here to deliver a product deliver a service you're here to do something that's what the client is paying you to do. That's what the customer is paying you to do. That's what the consumer is paying you to do. What we've got to do is integrate our SH&E values into that and be safe, healthy, and environmentally conscious while we're doing that. Um, so, again, shifting the paradigm to integrating these things. So um, you move from operations into commissioning, in other words, starting up. If you're, if it's a, if it's a uh, construction project, commissioning that. If it's a plant, obviously, um, or or whatever the next phase out of operations is, and then the fifth phase for us is closeout. So closeout would be closing something up, being fi finished with it. So well, there's um, things that we want to be done during that. We want lessons learned documents. Um, we want to make sure that any investigations that were uh, done during that process, whatever it was are uh, appropriately um, put into a repository and, and leveraged and used. One of the challenges we had in the organization for a long time, which I'd, uh, I, I'd assume is the case with, with many of you who are on the call today, is you know, when something happens at a project or, or at a facility 
and there's a, an investigation, and there's a lessons learned document, and there's a, uh, uh, an analysis written of whatever, whatever is done, if it's a root cause analysis, whatever's done, making sure that that information and the corrective actions and the lessons learned make it out to the entire organization. Well, what happens a lot of times when a project, for us, you know, for us, let's say it's a construction project, is closed out, too often those records would be closed out also. And they never made it to where it becomes part of our, you could call it whatever you want, call it your, your arsenal, call it your, your tool bag uh, or your toolkit, well, whatever. It becomes part of your uh, response for risk control and prevention and, and exposure. And then number five, uh, safety ownership begins when everyone holds themselves and others accountable. You know, it's okay. So, again, that feeds back into number one. Anyone can provide feedback, and then everyone has to hold each other accountable. If, if, if that is not a imperative and that is not a guiding principle uh, within your organization, it's going to be very difficult, again, if not impossible, to achieve EHS excellence because the climate's not there to do it. The, the, uh, the things that it takes to do that, you know, don't exist. Now, these principles apply, as I was talking about previously, they'd apply to, to pretty much everyone we come into contact with. I say pretty much because, you know, you, you cannot impose your guiding principles on the general public. Uh, that said, if the general public is in uh, our work zone or in our area, they're going to be affected by our value system. Uh, it's just the way it is. However, stakeholders, contractors, client representatives who work with or around us, they're going to be affected and understand our guiding principles. And 99.9% .9 of the time, they appreciate those principles, even if it does impede upon something they're trying to do, when understanding that this is ultimately, uh, these principles are in place to make your world, my world, our combined world a better place. Uh, folks tend to value that. Um, you know, everyone wants to function in a more, uh, you know, in a healthier environment. That said, not uh, folks don't always understand uh, what you're doing. That's uh, that, that's another important point I'd, I'd like to spend a minute on. It's important for folks to understand why you do what you do. You know, many times as a safety professional or a uh, you know w w whatever your prof professional background is, uh, we connect with or sometimes impose upon people based upon our professional status. Uh, my personal approach is to connect with people on a person-by-person -person basis. Uh, individuals are much more likely to take the, um, you know, directives or the um, whatever systems you are attempting to uh, uh, provide to them. They're much more likely to take them and own them from a point if they understand why they're coming, you know, why, why they're being brought to them, and if they like the person who's bringing them to them. So, you know, I, I would say a, a, an important factor in all of this is to be likable, to be uh, um, adaptable. Now, I make it a point to, you know, know folks' names. I make it a point when I go out to a project site or to a facility to uh, know people, remember names, remember faces. That makes it easy. And when there's not a lot of turnover, sometimes there is turnover. Sometimes things change. Uh, we are now in a world where we're doing most things virtually, so um, the need to adapt is is present. That said, it's still critically important to connect. Connect with people where they're at. Uh, when you connect with people where they're at, they're much more likely to uh, be willing to accept the things you're trying to uh, uh, you know bring to them. So um, all of this is not if you don't have senior level commitment. Uh, so Chuck Harrington is our CEO. Uh, and, you know, Chuck's a huge part of, of everything we do. And I, I don't say that just because it's, it's uh, you know, something that uh, becomes a, a cool thing to say because it has become a cool thing to say that, you know, CEO commitment is, you know, uh, you know who we are and our CEO is committed. Chuck's been our CEO since 2008. He's been a, a uh, EHS champion. Uh, that entire time. In fact, uh, it was Chuck who began to drive the process to reinvigorate our SHE program a few years ago. Uh, he just felt like we were kind of getting a little bit stale. And that's where some of these things that I'm talking about came from, the guiding principles. I'll get into our own zero, um, you know, in, in momentarily. 
Uh, but Chuck really drove that. He's been uh, involved in the Stand process. by. We're having a technical difficulty. Stand by one moment. Uh, Kendall, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, we can hear you now. Great. Okay. All right. So, sorry about that. How 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 long ago did you lose me? Did uh, it, the the current slide? Can I can I begin be, begin from there? Yes. Yeah, okay. This perfect. Slide right here. Okay. So. Um, so Chuck's been with, with the organization for 30 plus years and has been a EHS champion since then. So uh, what, what you see on the slide there, uh, the uh, National Safety Council, um, Chuck was a CEO who gets it back in 2011. And so he, he's been really driving the process um, pretty much since he's been here. And since he's been our chairman and CEO, he's really driven it. Uh, so, w w which is it, which is very important. It, it, it's it's critical, and what that does is it really helps us as the SHE organization to um, continue to push the value. You know, when you've got a you know, highly agile organization like ours, you're going to have um, turnover. That's just, and and I'm I'm sure many of you have seen that in your organizations. Well, if you don't have senior leaders who consistently um, value. Uh, maintain the values, uh, th th those can shift. Because every time someone comes into the organization, they come in with whatever culture, typically, whatever culture they're coming from. So in order to um, maintain uh, who we are, we've got to have that continuous support from CEO. So you know that can be a double-edged sword, because the flip side is, is you can't rest on your laurels either. Hey, we, we've got to continue to push our systems, push our processes. As I said, you know, I, I don't plan to get too deep into tactics here, but our SHE management systems, uh, I feel are world class. A part of that is by consistently pushing uh, to make them better, continuously improving them, continuously revising and updating, I, and that comes from a uh, from senior leadership who not only supports it but provides the resources to do that. Uh, without that, it's uh, very difficult. Again, if not impossible, to uh, begin to achieve uh, EHS excellence. So I told you I'd talk about Own Zero. So going back to the uh, executive committee meeting where we talked about the safety continuum, we uh, designed, uh, I say we, again, it was the entire executive committee over a few hours that, that came out with these, uh, laid out the guiding principles, and then ultimately is where Own Zero was born. So. We say own zero are the three pillars by which we, you know, place uh, our uh, our focus on where we want to improve on what we want to get better, uh, where we want to get better. Number one, protecting the quality of life. Going back to what I said before when I was talking about our guiding principles, it's not just protecting life uh, at work, keeping people safe. You know, one of the things that I um, have heard a lot in my career, I'm sure many of you have heard, is we want to send people home the way they, they, they came. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. 
uh, I would just add to that. We want to make them better. We want them and, and by uh, improving their life, improving the quality of life for the individual, for their family, their friends, their loved ones. Um, employee ownership is the second pillar, making sure that folks feel empowered uh, to not only do things like stop work, but to provide input, to provide feedback, to uh, provide innovations. Uh, we've got some uh, metrics uh, with it, specifically within the SHE group, that we are required to uh, have innovations within our groups. We have to target at least one per quarter. Doesn't mean they have to work, doesn't mean they have to be super successful. What it means is we've got to continue to stay on the edge to try and get better. Well, the only way to be successful in doing that is by pulling folks in, giving them ownership, and you would be amazed by the ideas that will come out of, uh, you know, people at, uh, who are out doing the work, right, at the line level, the middle management level. Uh, you'll get it periodically from the senior, senior management levels, but typically it's going to come from the line level or middle management level uh, employees. And then number three is exposure control. Really focusing on exposure control versus just focusing on injury prevention. If you remove the exposure, uh, everything that happens after that is now mitigated, right? We don't, you're not dealing with um, all of the incident management. It, and it, just think about this. If you're on the call and you are a SHE professional, take a minute and think about how much time and energy you have spent in your career on incident management. If it's investigation, maybe it's time going to the clinic, following up on clinic visits, whatever it is, uh, think about taking that time and switching it to prior to uh, something ever manifesting, something ever happening, to exposure control, to uh, preventative measures. You know, I'm not going to get too much into data management leading indicators, but you really should be focusing more on your leading indicators uh, than your lagging. Uh, so. Again, going back to these are the three pillars by which we um, try and focus. Your focus can be broader than this. It can be um, smaller than this. This is just where we've chosen to go. So own zero basically is how we have, um, you know, quick, when you say own zero, what that means is our philosophical approach to SHE management at Parsons. And that has kind of be, be, uh, become – uh, the way by which we talk safety is, hey, own zero. And um, so in different organizations, it can mean different things. In fact, I know for most most uh, Campbell Institute members, there's something else that you have, which is fine, right? It, 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 that's really not what's important. The key is to have something that is valued and something that uh, everybody understands what it means when you talk about it. So I want to spend a minute uh, getting into some of the tactics. So this specifically – um, come, came out of our uh, own zero philosophical approach, specifically high impact injury prevention. We've talked about it, CIF, you know, we, uh, a couple organizations at the last Campbell Symposium uh, did, did a couple really good presentations on their CIF programs. This is our version of that. We call them life changing events, our life changing event campaign. So it's pretty simply um, identified, excuse me, defined an event that either actually causes or, or has the potential to cause a work-related injury or an illness that is either life-threatening, life-altering, or fatal. The reason why we settled on calling it a life-changing event is because a life-changing event or SIF, serious injury or fatality, um, very rarely, if ever, actually it never affects just the individual that it happened to. It's going to affect a lot of folks. There's going to be some collateral effects in the immediate workplace, in the extended workplace, in the immediate family, in the extended family, um, in the immediate industry, in the extended industry, there's always going to have collateral effects. So as a result, we kind of wanted to have a broader definition. Again, with the idea of taking this to the entire organization, if we just said uh, serious injuries as a SH&E organization, we would totally understand what that meant. But we needed to make sure that everyone in the organization, our environmental engineers, to our architects, to our frontline labor construction workers, to our project managers, everyone understood. Everyone understands what a life-changing event is. Everyone understands what impact to the family is. So that's why you know we, we chose to settle on that. So we're, we're, what that looked like for us is we wanted to look at specifically within our organization the stuff that has happened 
how many of how much of that had life changing event potential? So we looked at two years worth of recordable injuries, and some of you may uh, may be thinking, well, why did you just look at recordables? And the reality is, is because we didn't feel the quality of our near miss reports were uh, to the level to really dissect and look at and analyze. And that was another, you know, byproduct of, of this, uh, this uh, working group that we put together to look at these uh, recordables was we realized we need to do a lot better when it comes to our near miss and uh, um, our, our p potential. So some events are near misses, some are, some are hazard IDs, some are stop works. Uh, what, what we call them is uh, anything that's pre preventable, again, prior to getting into an incident, we need to do a better job of looking, looking at those. So that said, we looked at two years worth of recordables, and what we learned was that 25% of those recordable injuries had LCE potential. Now, very few were actual LCEs where there was a serious injury that was going to uh, affect a uh, individual's immediate life or have collateral effects. Uh, but the fact that there was 25% that had LC potential was a big deal. Now, this is key. The group, the working group we put together were not SHE professionals. Nine inter interdisciplinary uh, operations folks. We pulled them from different markets, uh, from different uh, industrial applications. Some were project managers. Some were construction professionals. Uh, we had a few engineers. It was a very uh, intentionally... A uh, broad group of people. We wanted to get different perspectives and looking at this. Uh, we did it over over three weeks, so one week at a time, three times between uh, you know winter of 2018, spring of 2019. So, and we're still in the implementation phase of this. So the roadmap included, um, and one of the most important things is how you introduce it to the organization. You can't take some a, a large new approach to doing things, and I'll explain why it's new in a second. But you can't take anything that's new and just impose it on the audience. It's never going to be adopted. So we had to lay out a roadmap how we're going to do that. So before we even took it to the masses, we had to update our incident management system, our, our internal process by which we manage um, incidents, how things get categorized, how things get investigated, how lessons learned, uh, lessons learned get documented and distributed. We had to update that and make sure we were ready for LCE implementation. Uh, learning module and workshop. So we put together a learning module, but beyond that, you got to have a workshop where you give folks an opportunity to, to uh, ask questions, provide feedback. So ultimately, the way we work is the SHE group, we do not deliver our SHE imperatives to, uh, th that's something that our operational leaders do. We are, um, you know, you could call us SMEs if you want, you could call us support for that process, but we believe that our leaders need to lead. So when it comes to something like LCE, if they don't fully understand it, and if they don't fully own it, it's not going to be effectively rolled out. So you got to have workshops to give folks an opportunity to do that. Uh, updating and re revising our SMS. So our safety management system, we uh, believe it's really good, but it didn't include anything related to these, this new approach. So we had to update that and revise that. Uh, and then implement new metrics. Remember this, and as many of you heard, you can't manage it if you don't measure it. If we're not measuring LTEs, we can't manage them. If we can't manage them, we can't prevent them. So then what, you know, ultimately what's the point? So I talked about the changing direction. So um, you guys have all seen the iceberg uh, before, but it's a little bit different, you know, if you look at it here. Traditional approach, fatality, lost time, recordable first aid, it, it's focused on incident management. We've shifted our paradigm to look at exposure control. We want to alleviate um, things like high-risk situations, uh, look at facilities and equipment, look at the operations, look at the human interactions. How do we begin to address and prevent these things? Uh, have a better understanding of the processes and systems that go through that. And then ultimately, and if, uh, you, you could say most importantly, if you're looking at rating these, is understanding behaviors of our, of, of, of our, our folks. What types of at-risk behaviors are taking place? Uh, and how do we step into that process and begin to, you know, affect change in that area? Another thing we learned is we've got to do a much, 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 much better job as an organization when it comes to incident investigations. It's not enough to say, oh, well, we got to do better, you know, better training or PPE. That, it was, it was a little disappointing to see how many 
uh, investigations that it ultimately came down to. The person wasn't trained and didn't, well, that, that's not getting to the root of, of it in many cases. So again, going back to what I said, having a greater focus on proactive events, looking at near misses, hazard IDs and stop work, uh, actuals and uh, potentials. So leadership participation in EHS. I, I talked previously about the importance of having your leaders lead. Uh, that's what they're there to do. So remember this, what the leader does is gonna set the climate and that's gonna in turn dictate the attitudes, beliefs that are going to happen in the organization. I say this to, to folks all the time. Employees are going to do what their leaders want out of them. Therefore, if, our lead, if your leaders aren't held accountable for leading uh, your, your SHD programs, if there aren't uh, specific things that they are assigned to do that are part of the, the review process and, and part of, of who they are, uh, it's not going to come out into the culture. If uh, the leader's focus is just on whatever their operational activity is, uh, it, it, it's going to fail. So the leaders' uh, deliverables have to be aligned with the SHE system deliverables, and they've got to be integrated. So what does that integration look like? Um, so a couple things that we do, again, this gets into some of the tactics. Project risk memos. A risk memo is, is written for uh, what projects that meet a certain risk threshold, and so there's some specifics to that, but it, the uh, risk is looked at and analyzed. This happens in the business development phase before we take on the work. A demonstrated management commitment from our business leaders, again, going back to some of the metrics that we have and how we measure some of that, our core value metrics. So again, I, I started by talking about how we're driven by our core values. Well, we measure that. You can't manage what you don't measure. So we have to measure how are we adhering to our values? And um, you know, what does that look like? Are we falling short? Where do we need to improve on? Uh, I mentioned previously about legal compliance. Every project, every location, every facility, uh, basically every task has a risk and a legal compliance register. These are two separate documents. Legal compliance only addresses what we are legally bound to uh, comply with here from an SHE point of view. Risk register is a little bit different. It, 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 uh, it includes the risk that we're looking at and the likely, uh, the, the risk that will, uh, you know, manifest itself during the work. Uh, again, making sure the SH needs sustainability is included in all planning. So that's prior to the project, you know, during the project, all scheduled meetings, making sure it's integrated into everything. Um, and then executive project risk review, going back to the risk memo. Uh, so you've got different risk profiles and just risk thresholds. If you hit a certain threshold, a memo is going to have to be uh, drafted before we move on into any business development. Beyond that, if, if it hits another, a higher risk threshold, there's got to be executive project risk review where we specifically talk about the SHE related risk and determine is this work that we are going to do? Is this something that we want to proceed with? Does this align with our values? Um, so th this slide, just kind of a lot of times, a lot of questions I get from folks is, well, how do we effectively integrate um, operations with EHS systems when the product of each is different? I would say the product is not different, right? We're all after the same goal. Uh, and that's critical to, um, you know, be on that level plane where everybody understands we're after the same goal. You can't have your SHE department be focused on keeping your your, pre, your workers' comp premiums manageable and your EMR low and your incidence rate, rates low while you have your operations group focused on, um, you know, heavy production, meeting the schedule, and making margin. Well, these goals have got to be integrated. So, um, you know, one of the ways we do it is by integrating our world-class approaches with strong core values, making sure we remain technically excellent, but also focusing on the bottom line making sure our employees own the processes, but maintaining discipline risk control. Uh, so it, once you integrate these things, what you're gonna start to realize is there's some really good artifacts that come out of it. Employee morale is gonna be improved. It's gonna be a clear discriminator uh, between uh, your organization and others that you uh, benchmark with. Um, and it's gonna ultimately uh, accomplish the goal that a lot of SHME programs um, have as part of their beginnings. You know, um, which is 
legal compliance, and workers' compensation control. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about, we have just a few minutes, is, is how to ensure your leaders effectively lead during critical events. Uh, something that every organization is dealing with right now is the uh, COVID-19 crisis. It's something that is new and different for most organizations. Um, and so there's really no book on this. Uh, there, there are some really good books. In fact, in my notes here, a book that I've, uh, uh, in fact, I didn't put it in my notes. Let me share it with you. Stephen Fink, it's called Crisis Communications by Stephen Fink. I, try, I strongly recommend you read that and you share that with your leaders. Communications are critical um, in times of crisis. Uh, but ultimately, a, a couple things that you, you want to take away. Make sure that you've got an interdisciplinary team that's going to lead your critical event leadership. It shouldn't be led by one group. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be siloed. It's got to be something that uh, a, a working group or a task force is brought together to lead. It's got to be interdisciplinary, folks from different parts of the organization. Remember this, different people in different parts of the organization are going to have different outlooks based upon where they're at. Well, you want to make sure you have all that um, as you're making decisions um, or, or as – whoever that group is, is making decisions uh, related to critical events. Um, and then make, so in our case, uh, when there's a critical event unfolding, be it SHD related or other, uh, you got to have regular meetings. If it's weekly, if it's daily, whatever it is. In the case of COVID-19, uh, we were meeting almost daily, and these were virtual meetings. Um, you know, that, that's changed a little bit. Now that we're starting to kind of move into the next phase of uh, the, the, the meetings aren't uh, necessary daily. They're still regular, regular uh, and they're still virtual. Uh, but the key is, is have a plan. Um, most, uh, a lot of organizations don't have a plan when it comes to stuff like this. I mean, a plan that goes beyond basic business continuity, it's got to go beyond that. And you've all heard it said before, you fail to plan, plan to fail. Um, so. That's all I have, and we've got a few minutes for questions. Um, so anybody, uh, in fact, I'm looking down. Catherine, do you have any, you, you, you want to you wanna help me with this yeah. one? Any, any questions? Yeah, thanks, Jason. Um, so it doesn't look like the audience has um, put in any questions. Um, so while they think through their thoughts and, and think if they have, any, have anything to, to ask you, um, you know, just reflecting on the presentation, you've you've given um, you've given us all a lot to think about when it comes to how Parsons um, manages their business and also their man their uh, EHS management system. And so, I think from a very high level, if if you can give one final thought to the audience about if there was just one key thing that folks should um, uh, should focus on or look at. Um, and uh, to really bring positive change to their organizations. Um, is there maybe just one, uh, you know, one final thought in that in that regard? Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Love the question. Bit of, uh, and and the answer is this: people, people first. Treat people like people. Value them for who they are, where they're at, what they're going through. In times like this, more than ever, um, just because. And when I say more than ever, it's only because what you know we're all dealing with one, uh, you know, similar challenge. Um, while while we're still dealing with everything else in our personal lives. You know, don't have your program be a system that exists for the purpose that it has to exist. Value people for where they're at. Meet them where they're at. They will follow you uh, if they, you know, they realize and they understand and they identify with the fact that you value them. Um, so I would say put your focus on the people um, not only within your organization, but all around you. And you will start to see your EHS programs go to heights that you didn't think that uh, you could get them to. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Jason. We only have about a minute left. Uh, so I'll go ahead and close, uh, close us out today. So I want to thank everybody for joining uh, this webinar about the Campbell Award and, of course, about our 2019 Campbell Award winner, uh, Parsons Corporation. And a big thank you to Jason and, and, a, and a few um, comments have come in as a well-deserved thank you and, and praise for your, for, uh, your presentation. Um, I did want to remind everybody that if they are interested in applying for the award, they can find all of the information on CampbellAward.org as well as Parsons' full uh, winning application has been posted there along with all of the other uh, winning applications that we have. 
Um, our deadline for uh, 2020 has been extended to August 1st in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So if you have any questions, please reach out. And a final thank you to Jason and um, for giving the presentation and of course, all of our audience members. Take care.